and Central Florida folks here as well. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started for today. Thank you for joining us for Gardening in the Panhandle Live, all about tomatoes today. Uh, it's always a hot topic. We've got a big crowd today and a great group of panelists here. I'll start introducing them. Uh, sort of our esteemed guest today is uh, Sam Hutton. Sam, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and introduce yourself to the group? Sure, sure. Sam Hutton. I'm originally from Mississippi. Um, I grew up on a small farm there. We raised a lot of row crops. I worked for my dad all the way through high school um, and loved the summer um, family garden. Got into tomatoes a good bit there. And in a roundabout way, I ended up here in Florida. I studied at University of Florida and I studied tomato breeding and genetics. And that's what I do now. I run the, the UF tomato breeding program um, down close to Tampa in Waimama, Florida. Waimama, what a name. Evan, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Evan Anderson. I am the current horticulture agent in Walton County, uh, right there in the middle of the panhandle. Yep, happy to have you on here. And some, some frequent contributors to Gardening the Panhandle Live, we have Larry Williams. Good afternoon. I'm glad to be part of the panel. Look forward to uh, helping with tomato production. I'm a horticulture agent in Okaloosa County. Thanks, Larry. And finally, last but not least, we have Matt Lawler on our panel today. Hey, I'm uh, Matt Lawler. I'm the commercial horticulture agent in Santa Rosa County. Awesome. And we want to give Julie McConnell and Beth Bowles, our uh, technicians behind the scenes today, a shout out. Thanks to those two ladies for joining us and helping out. And so we'll dive right in. Whoever sent this first question in via Zoom, God bless you. This is a wonderful way to get started. And so I'm going to throw this to Evan Anderson, my former colleague in Walton County. So Evan, the question, why are tomatoes red? <laughs> why are tomatoes red? That is a good question. Um, and I've got kind of two answers for you. Uh, the first right. one is uh, fruits in general tend to be brightly colored to attract animals so that they will eat the fruits and spread them around via usually their droppings. Um, so that helps the seeds spread and gets the plants where they normally wouldn't be able to get. Uh, if you're wanting to know how to make your tomatoes redder, I've got a little link there in the chat that Beth just posted. Um, the uh, research I've done says that uh, antioxidants, which uh, lycopene is one, and that's the red pigment in tomatoes, uh, the tomatoes tend to make more antioxidants such as lycopene when the temperatures get hotter or they're under stress. So if you want redder tomatoes, I guess just leave them outside in the summer here and they should get some heat stress uh, for you. But uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's why tomatoes are red. Interesting. Things you never, never really thought about till right then. Uh, Matt Lawler, uh, we love tomatoes here in Florida. They're by far the most popular fruit that's planted nationwide in backyard gardens. Uh, you know, we have a warm climate, unlike some places around the country. So can we grow tomatoes year round? What say you? I guess the simple answer is we can't grow tomatoes year round, but we can grow tomato plants potentially year round. Okay. Um, so if you had an indeterminate variety, so a vining type tomato, um, you could continue to let that plant grow and vine, um, cut some leaves off uh, towards the lower section of that vine and cut some suckers off and, and train it so that when temperatures got right for creating tomatoes again, um, we could grow tomatoes again. Uh, tomatoes, once the nighttime temperature gets to 75 degrees or you know in the 70s, uh, the tomatoes aren't gonna set fruit. So we can grow that plant. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of work <laughs> and probably a lot of fungicides and insecticides, but there is a potential to grow it year round. Uh, and I did, uh, we're gonna post a link uh, for growing vegetables under shade structures. Uh, so that's another option uh, just to keep the plants a little bit cooler um, and help them survive the, the heat of summer. Uh, but under that shade, you're not getting that light penetration, so you'll still run into the, uh, not be able to produce fruit. So the answer is yes, but it's difficult. Okay, cool. Sam, we're gonna come right into you on the next question. Um, and you can comment if you'd like on, on either of the previous two, if you have something to add. But the question here is, and we got many questions uh, very similar to this one. Uh, and is it is it better to grow tomatoes in containers or in the ground? And if you choose containers, what type and size would you uh, recommend for folks to choose? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess it's a little bit of a trade-off there. There's some advantages and disadvantages sure. to either one. Um, uh, the advantages to having your plants in containers, one is you might be able to jump, get a jump start on the season, uh, get planted early. And then if you got a freeze coming, you might be able to bring those containers inside if you don't have too many of them. Um, you can also avoid some pests and diseases that you could have in your garden. If you've got nematodes and you know, know that, then getting out of the ground into a container can be helpful. Some other diseases as well. Um, the downside is, well, you got to buy the container. You, yep. uh, you may have to purchase the soil, the media, and then you, yep. it adds a little bit of work to you, uh, to the job there. So um, that's uh, as far as the size of the, and the type of the container, really, it's whatever you want. I mean, some folks uh, use grow bags and down here we use grow bags, which is basically like a small garbage bag, um, yeah. a, little bit, a little bit thicker plastic. Uh, I'd say the larger, the better, the larger the container, the better, because you are restricting the, uh, the, the media that that root can grow into. And there's only so much water to go around. So the smaller the container you use, the more frequently you have to water to keep that soil consistently moist. Um, so, tip. yeah. Okay. So again, either is, either is possible. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Matt, we're going to kind of uh, just piggyback on that question. So if we decide to grow in the ground, uh, what would be the ideal soil for growing cherry tomatoes? Or if you're in a container, what kind of mix would you look at? And they say cherries, but really, you know, any kind of tomato, what would you suggest? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, usually for most vegetable crops, we want a well-drained soil. And that's a, a very vague, generic answer. Um, but, but we want to have some good organic matter in there uh, to help um, hold nutrients in that soil. So let's say if we just grew in a, a straight sand, um, that would be pretty much like growing hydroponically. So we'd have to constantly be giving that crop uh, nutrients. So maybe like a liquid fertilizer um, just to keep it, keep it happy and healthy. But uh, we put a, a link in the, the chat for um, building organic matter, um, which like most things in Florida is more difficult than other states uh, because we, we don't get nearly as cool. So we're always got microorganisms breaking down everything that we put into our, our soil to try to enhance it. Um, so just, just some tips in that publication there. As far as a, like a container mix, um, I think we'll hit on it maybe a little bit later if we have time, um, but uh, some of the like hydroponic growers have gone to a, just a straight composted pine bark mix. Um, and it's important that that pine bark is composted because uh, if not, it'll pull nutrients away from the root system. Um, but that's, that's something uh, that is not super easy to find, but fairly easy to, to come across and uh, does a good job. And it's got some weight to it. So if you've got a container, um, it holds the pot in place. So you're not worrying about plants blowing all over the place or pots falling over. That's interesting. Sam, in your experience, if you could grow tomatoes anywhere in the ground in Florida, where's the best soil? Not in Tampa. Um, okay. <laughs> but he was just talking about growing in the sand. That's all we have here. Yeah. And we do inject nutrients into our irrigation water multiple okay. times a day. So um, he's exactly right on that. Yeah. yeah. North, North Florida is a great place. There's a lot of good soil up there. Okay. And Matt Lawler, very related to this. Um, let's say you are stuck with that extremely sandy soil. Um, do you have a chance at growing tomatoes in the ground in your backyard, not in a commercial setting? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it'd probably be easier than growing in something really heavy where you have to worry about, you know, working out a drainage system. Um, right. But, uh, just like I mentioned earlier, you're just going to have to keep up with your uh, nutrient regimen. Uh, to keep those tomatoes healthy um, and then uh, just try to grow that organic matter as much as you can. Uh, you might also want to think about having some uh, like green manure, so some crops down uh, your row middles in your tomatoes, maybe some clover or something uh, to help add, add nutrients back into the soil and just cut it periodically um, and keep it under control. All right. Um, gotten some good comments there in the chat. Billy says we have sandy soil in Micanopy. Straw bales work for us. I've grown the straw bales before, and that certainly can work. That's a good idea. Larry, 
We're going to come to you over there in Okaloosa County. We had lots of questions about this. Um, and of course, we've got people from all over North Florida uh, here today. So maybe you can speak on the panhandle and then we'll throw it to Sam and might speak a little bit more to North uh, and Central Florida. But when is the best time to plant tomatoes in North Florida, Larry? What do you think? I think overall, people need to remember that tomato is tropical in origin. It's a tropical plant, I think, uh, is native to Western parts of South America, primarily Peru. And there, in its native habitat, it'll function as a perennial. So we're trying to get a perennial plant to do everything that we want it to do within months that it would do in its native habitat in years. And it being tropical, it needs warm weather. Here in extreme North Florida, I, I really wouldn't recommend planting tomatoes much earlier than the 1st of April. It's not just air temperature. You might get by with planting earlier than that and not have a late frost or freeze. But even if that happens, it takes consistently warm nights for that soil temperature to um, get to the optimal temperature. Otherwise, the plant sometimes will sit there somewhat stunted. And uh, to have the optimal conditions for that tropical plant to take off, it is a heat loving plant. Um, here in extreme North Florida, I, I would hold up if you can until after the 1st of April. Excellent answer. So Sam, let's say we're moving down a little bit towards, you know, Gainesville, Micanopy, Crystal River, even Ocala. What would you recommend in that area? Because we do have a few listeners today from that, that neck of the woods. Yeah, it is a great question. I echo what Larry said that um, you've got to stay away from those freezing temperatures, the frost, I mean, clearing a frost-free date. Um, soil temperature is, uh, it, it gets less cold down here, further south you go, um, so mm -hmm. that's not as much of an issue. Um, if you are fighting the cooler soil temperatures, going into some raised beds will help, and then back to those containers like we talked about a minute ago. Um, down here in the Tampa area, our growers will start planting mid-January. Um, that's, okay. that's a little bit of a risk that they take because we could get a freeze like we did on uh, around January 31st yeah. here. Um, so, so maybe around mid-February would be a safe date down this far south, maybe late February, uh, early March up in the Micanopy, Gainesville areas, and then keep, uh, keep pushing that date back a little bit as you go north. That's right. Good deal. Thank you, guys. That's a great answer. And so, Sam, again, this is extremely mm -hmm. related. Um, once you decide that time to plant tomatoes, um, is it better to start tomatoes from seed or get transplants? And you maybe talk about if you're going to grow from seed, when you might want to start those. And also if seed, you know, maybe touch on planting depth just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's another great question. Um, <laughs> I mentioned growing up as a, as a kid and having that family garden, all I ever did was get transplants. Um, but yep. once I started growing my own transplants, it got to be a lot of fun. I, I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of what variety you can get if you're purchasing seed. If you're getting, getting transplants, you really are limited to what uh, your provider has available for you. Um, so it's a matter of preference, but you got better flexibility with seed there. Um, I'd say that uh, transplants are pretty easy because somebody's already grown them for a number of weeks or a couple of months. Um, if you're going from seed, then you gotta you gotta learn how to grow transplants yourself. Okay. About how far ahead are you if you plant transplants as far as time? Uh, good question. Um, how big of a transplant do you want? Um, okay. If you're wanting something just kind of small, sure. Uh, six seven weeks, six to eight weeks maybe. Really? Um, if you want a larger plant, if you want to put it into a quart size container or something like that, then you're pushing eight to ten weeks probably. So it, it's really up to you and what you want to do. Um, it's nice to get a jump start on the season if you go really early and grow some larger transplants, right? But um, you may need um, you may need some lights, so you may need to move your plants outside on sunny days to get enough light on them. Um, and then if you're growing transplants, you got to avoid overwatering, over fertilizing. You don't want a lush transplant. You want a transplant that just barely scrapes along in terms of water and nutrients, so that it's nice and hard, nice and tough when it, when you stick it out there in the in your garden. Um, for sowing seed, your planting depth is not very deep at all. I mean, I'd say probably a half a centimeter, maybe a centimeter at the most. And then you just keep that soil moist until your plant starts growing. Um, and then nurse those plants along with light and minimal fertilizer. 
All right, awesome. That's a pretty comprehensive answer. I appreciate it. Uh, Matt Lawler, so this is a question that I've run into in the past in my own raised bed system in my garden. If, if you choose to grow in raised beds, should you do, practice crop rotation within those raised beds? Say, you know, you had tomatoes in one bed last year, should you grow them, uh, or is it okay to grow them again in the same bed the next year? What do you, let's uh, say. You definitely need to rotate your, your crops. Uh, probably the worst case of root knot nematodes I've seen was and raised beds, uh, just tomatoes that somebody really? grew over and over again. Yeah. Um, so, you know, rotate with not just something other than a tomato, but something out of the tomato family. So if something out of the Solanaceae family, don't, don't plant peppers or eggplant or something like that behind tomatoes. Um, switch it up with like a leafy green crop or um, kale or cabbage or something like that. Um, another thing you could do uh, if, if you're kind of in the, the middle of summer or uh, maybe the winter and you don't really have any food crops that you could grow, you could choose a cover crop to grow. So winter you might do wheat or oats or rye or something like that. And summer you could do um, some other types of some grasses or uh, some different field peas and things uh, just to get some rotation going. transplants that came to her house with root knot nematodes uh, so she now starts her own from seed have you seen that before sam bringing problems home with transplants oh it can certainly happen i haven't i haven't seen it with nematodes but i've seen it with other things um late blight diseases tomato yellow leaf curl virus, all sorts of things could happen <laughs> okay cool matt we're gonna stay with you evan and larry don't get too comfortable we're gonna head back your way here in just a second but matt um this is a, an interesting question. It's, it's probably a, uh, it depends answer, but if you plant tomatoes, say mid-March, like uh, you and Sam and Larry are recommending, uh, how long will they produce fruit for you? Uh, so we mentioned it earlier, but you know, when our nighttime temperatures get in the, the 70s, uh, we're going to start to uh, stop setting fruit. Um, so, you know, that happens. Just, again, it, it depends, but uh, we're getting those temperatures in June or so um, at the latest. Probably. Yeah. And so you may set fruit, uh, the last fruit you set, let's say it's in the middle of June. How long does it take a tomato to ripen? What, 60 days, 70 days, something like that? It takes a while and you're running into more pest issues um, yeah. trying to push your tomatoes that late. So you got a lot of caterpillar pests coming in and stink bugs and things. Yeah. So, I mean, theoretically, August-ish, but probably not. <laughs> so I've never had super great luck in the panhandle that late. Uh, so Matt, we're going to finish up here with uh, hydroponic gardening system. So this person's thinking about hydroponic gardening, some tomato plants this year. Um, you mentioned earlier that pine bark mix that you like, but do you think a 50-50 mix of perlite and vermiculite would be a good approach? Yeah, I thought that was an interesting question. Um, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what the benefit of mixing the two would be. Um, you know, you probably just go with one or the other. Uh, but the problem that you, you would run into was, you know, those products don't weigh very much. Um, and even just sitting on the top of the, the container, um, if you're uh, out in the open, or even if you just have like a high tone or something where you've got some winds coming in, uh, you'd have to worry about that, that material blowing off the top of that container and blowing out of that container. Um, so that, that would probably be my, my biggest concern uh, with those products. Um, but I mean, I, I think a 50-50 mix would be, you know, do just as well as one of the, uh, you know, either perlite or vermiculite by itself. Okay, so maybe making things a little more complicated than, than need to be. So yeah, I mean, good. I guess you could take some, some plastic mulch or something and put it over the top of the, the, the pots just to keep it from blowing out. Yeah. So we've got some good questions in the chat that we're going to get to here shortly on disease. But Sam, we're going to, we're coming right into your wheelhouse here, starting with some variety selection questions. And let's be honest, this is what people are here for. They want to know what to plant. So uh, there's many questions asked, uh, basically, what varieties for uh, Northwest and North Florida um, would you consider as a homeowner? Yeah, that's, man, what a great question. <laughs> it's not broad at all. 
no, no, it's, it's very specific. Um, no, there again, there's so, so many options out there available to, to all of us. So um, I'd say, I'd say no, first of all, know what your diseases are there. I know tomato spotted okay. wilt virus can be a problem in North Florida. Tomato yellow leaf curl virus can be a problem. Um, there's plenty of varieties out there with spotted wilt resistance. There's a few out there with TYL CV resistance, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Um, if you know you have nematodes and you're wanting to go into the soil again, get a variety with nematode resistance, right? So the um, almost anywhere you go to get seed, it's going to tell you what the resistance package is on that variety. If you're wanting to grow an heirloom variety, then most likely it doesn't have any resistance at all. So um, get into some containers, rotate your crop, whatever you have to do. Um, so that would be my first suggestion is just looking into disease resistances that are available. The other one is knowing what type of tomatoes you want to grow. I, I think we're going to come to a question in a minute about indeterminate versus determinate. That's a good thing to look at when you're when you're looking into varieties. Um, and then just, I mean, what type? Do you like Roma tomatoes? Do you like rounds? Do you like cherries? Um, play around with it. I have the most fun when I just start getting seed from anywhere and everywhere and, and test them out and seeing what does the best in my garden, um, which ones I and my kids like to eat the most. Um, that's just, that's what I do. It's, it's fascinating Absolutely. to me. What, um, what does your breeding program focus on, if you don't mind me asking? Um, no, I don't mind at all. So the breeding program here focuses primarily on our grower industry in the state. So Florida has about 25,000 acres in production each year. Um, they grow determinate var varieties um, almost exclusively. And they grow between, um, I guess they're harvesting between September, October, all yeah. the way through May. So it's almost the full year of harvesting somewhere between North Florida and Homestead right. down there below Miami. Um, so I focus a lot on disease resistance, focus a lot on yield, and then okay. a lot of quality aspects of the fruit. Um, you name it, if it's, if it's important <laughs> to our growers, I'm probably working on it. I hear you. So Larry, we're going to start getting into some specific varieties here. Uh, and I'll, I'll start this with you, Larry, and anybody's welcome to answer. Uh, but there was a lots of questions on, are there any heat resistant varieties that produce during the summer? I mean, Matt mentioned, uh, you know, tomatoes quit setting fruit at a certain temperature. Um, and if there are, do they taste good? Um, so what, what say you, Larry, and then uh, after Larry finishes, uh, input from you other guys. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we're, Florida's known for sunshine and, and heat, and uh, temperature's a big deal with tomatoes, with the um, pollination and, and primarily fertilization. Uh, even the pollen tube will be shortened or won't grow properly under, you know, hotter temperatures. There are varieties to look for, but I should say this before I mention a few. You don't gain a lot, is my understanding. You know, you may gain a few degrees more with some of these heat tolerant uh, types, but University of Florida has developed some, uh, one of which is solar fire, solar as in sun and fire. Um, that's uh, if you can get the plant or get the seeds, that should be a good choice. And uh, I think it has a good taste. Um, all of the cherry types pretty much have a higher degree of, of tolerance to heat, but they're not your big slicing type tomatoes. Uh, heat wave two is one that probably is easy to find. And um, the solar set is an older one. I don't see as much anymore. And then there's a heat master but um, any of those, if you can find them, would give you a little better heat tolerance and maybe production under a little warmer temperatures. I think Sam's done some work with that. Right. Yeah, thanks for throwing the plug in. He led you right into it, Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the heat tolerance is really important for some of our growers, and so that's something that we work on here. Um, yeah, Larry mentioned uh, solar set. That's a really old variety. It actually tastes pretty good. Um, only downside is you can't get seed anymore. Um, so it, uh, even I can't get seed anymore of that one. Uh, solar fire, that's another variety that has some heat tolerance to it. Um, that one you might be able to find seed of, but it's gonna be in limited quantities now. They, uh, the company is not producing new seed any longer. Um, I have to throw a plug in for a variety. I didn't mention it on the last one. That's 
a variety called Tasty Lee. All right, this is one developed by my advisor for my PhD. It was developed by Jay Scott and it was developed for superior flavor, okay? It has some heat tolerance to it also. Not a really high degree, but it's got some. Um, it does not have tomato spotted wilt virus resistance. So if you know you're gonna have problems with that or with nematodes, this variety doesn't have, doesn't have resistance to those. Um, there's a new variety that should be coming out pretty soon. I'm hopeful it comes out soon called Solar Dancer. And that was one that we developed here in our program. So seed is not yet commercially available, but I hope to see that change in the next year or so. Um, and, and then I think like Larry mentioned, you're just helping out just a little bit with this heat tolerant fruit setting ability. You're probably not gonna be able to grow during the summer, right? But if you're planting in, in July or something, trying to get a fall garden in, these, these type varieties would set, a, set fruit a little bit earlier than most of your other varieties. Awesome information. So other than Tasty Lee, maybe look for things that have solar and sun and heat and things like that in the name. So That's right. Great. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. Um, so Larry, this is a very specific question. You don't have to get super in depth, but we have a listener from Bay County that wants to know what tomatoes grow best in inland Bay County. And so maybe what I'd want you to focus on here are, are there inland and coastal considerations here in the Panhandle? You know, a lot of our counties go all the way from the Gulf up to the Alabama line. Um, so maybe talk about that a little bit and if there would be differences. Yeah. Well, I mean, right along the coast would not be provide optimal conditions for tomatoes, um, the salt conditions, the deep, sandy, uh, infertile soils there, uh, the, the winds uh, could play a role. But um, I, I'll i give you a, a few that, that I, I've grown a lot of different varieties. And, and like Sam, I, I like to try some and, and you have to remember though, cause you've got what 80, 90 plus days be between planting and harvesting. And you need to have some way to remember what varieties you planted uh, 90 days later when you're harvesting, you may say, I don't want to plant this one ever again, but you don't remember what it was, or this was the best tomato I've ever had. Uh, I would encourage you to label those somehow so that you know what you've got. Amelia is a uh, determinant variety that I've tried. Now, I personally like it. I've talked to some master gardeners that haven't had great success with it, but it makes a nice size slicing tomato to me that has a good taste. Um, Bella Rosa, uh, Krista, Fletcher, Quincy, those are all uh, what I consider good determinant varieties. Um, the Tasty Lee that was mentioned uh, is, is a, a good choice. And one final one as far as, again, a determinant variety, which farmers mostly grow. I think 100% of what they grow would be determinant versus indeterminate. But the um, one that I still like is better bush. Um, it's a compact plant, but it's, a, it's also a determinant. And I think it, I've had good luck with it. Okay, good deal. Um, let's move to a little bit different category of tomatoes that we actually haven't touched on very much. Sam, what is the viability of trying to grow romas in Florida? I know they're very popular, um, you know, for paste tomatoes and some salad applications. Uh, can you grow romas here? And if so, uh, maybe some variety recommendations. Yeah, so um, romas, like any other tomato, it's, it's just the type, it's the fruit shape there. Um, some varieties of romas are bred just for processing tomatoes. Those you wouldn't really see much in a, in a seed catalog. Those are mostly sold in California and stuff to growers out there. Um, but any other Roma variety, it would grow really similarly to what we get around here. Um, so again, give it, I mean, try anything you like. The, the variety that our growers grow most down here is a variety called Mariana. It does well for them. I've never thought it was the best tasting, but I haven't found very many Roma varieties that are as full of flavor as some of those rounds are anyway. Uh, one thing I've noticed with Romas is that I tend to see a little bit more blossom end rot on Roma types. So if you are trying them, just be mindful of that. Maybe watch your watering um, a little bit more, keep it more consistently moist and stuff. Try to avoid the blossom end rot. Awesome. And Donna Kramer says she has had success with Amish paste, paste in Pace, Florida. That's a apt for Pace, Florida. Paste in Pace. Uh, great there. Uh, Evan, 
Now this is this is a question for you here now. What is the the, ab, the best tomato variety for Northwest Florida? So if you had to pick <laughs> one cherry and one regular, this person will say go to. Okay. I I can't give you just one. Um, <laughs> There's no absolute best variety, and that's that's uh, um, there's no silver bullet for anything. So uh, it depends what pests and diseases you have. It depends what uh, what you're looking to. If you're looking for an easy tomato that if you just can't seem to get a tomato through and and get a nice one off the vine, uh, go for a cherry tomato. Those are practically weedy and they're much easier to grow. Um, we've had some success with uh, Super Sweet 100 here at our office. Uh, the um, bigger tomatoes, uh, there's a number of different ones out there. They've already talked about the uh, heat tolerant ones. I'm going to put a link in the in the chat there to the uh, uh, Florida tomato or, or vegetable growing guide, um, the tomato section specifically which covers a lot of other varieties that are good for Florida. Um, the, the trick can be trying to find one of them at a, a seed provider. Um, some of them aren't just, just aren't available uh, widely. So uh, we've used Amelia, um, we've used German Johnson, which is an old heirloom variety that doesn't have any disease, disease resistant. Um, we've, you know, we've tried a bunch of different ones here at our office and, and you know, uh, it just depends. Your mileage um, may vary. Your mileage may vary depend on your your individual situation. But yeah, man, that's not what I wanted to hear, Evan. I wanted to hear yeah. the tomato you had to grow. But that's all right. I guess we'll let you slide. Uh, Sam, this is an interesting question. Got a lots of people asking this one. Um, of course, everybody wants to know that one tomato that's going to be perfect. But I think the question here: which slicing type tomatoes are best for containers in Florida? Uh, maybe the best way to speak to that is, you know, overall size and determinant versus indeterminate. What might do better in a container? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, the, it definitely relates to what Evan was just trying to answer. Um, the best variety. So, yeah. um, if if the question is determinate versus indeterminate, then I'll just throw again throw out some advantages and disadvantages. Um, Please, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. With the with the determinate those plants tend to just set all their fruit in a short period of time and then the plant's done and it starts to decline. Okay. So if you want to get your crop off quickly and get a bunch of tomatoes off quickly, a determinate variety might be the way to go. Those indeterminates, they keep growing. The yield's going to be kind of slow and steady with those. So if you've got a short season, you might not be picking a whole lot, right? If you can grow them a little bit longer, then you get that steady yield over time. Um, those indeterminate varieties tend to be a little bit sweeter. The fruit are just a little bit sweeter than they are for determinate. So you just kind of have to think about that. You only have so many leaves on your plant and now you've got all your fruit at once. There's, you have to spread out those carbohydrates across a lot of fruit at one time. So it just makes sense physiology, uh, physiologically. Um, the indeterminates also will kind of, since they keep growing, they kind of outgrow some of the diseases we might get here in Florida if the pressure is not too high they just keep putting on new leaves and those old leaves might die off but the plant keeps putting on new leaves so it, the disease might seem less severe for that reason um so yeah those are the those are just the general comments and and that and that would work whether you're in a container or not right um yeah. i know okay. just tying it back to some of the earlier comments on how long tomato plants can really grow when you get into commercial greenhouses, they'll grow those plants for nine, 10, 11 months out of the year. And they, they only grow indeterminate types and they grow them and just stretch that plant for 15, 20 feet down the row. So it's, it's pretty cool. And are commercial field productions exclusively determinants, correct? Almost exclusively. There's a little bit of indeterminates out there, but they require taller stakes, more management, and then they have to harvest a lot more often. Right. Good answer. I know we're not getting, you know, that one variety everybody's looking for, but hopefully we're giving you the tools to be able to pick those varieties from the, the catalog or the store shelf you may find yourself in. Matt, um, this question came in. I thought this was an interesting question. Um, the best type for all day sun, and I'm just thinking like, uh, 
I'm not sure what they mean by that. So maybe you could speak on, I thought, tomato light requirements. You know, something like that might be a, a good way to answer this question. So what, what do tomatoes need as far as sun goes? Yeah, so I mean, tomatoes, like most vegetables, are going to need, you know, like a full day's worth of sun. So, you know, eight hours or so. Um, my other thought on that question might be just like dealing with some afternoon sun um, as we go through the late spring and, and summer. Sure. Uh, so you might want to consider uh, planting your tomatoes where, where they get a little bit of uh, shade from that afternoon sun. So, you know, plant them so they've got a barrier on their southwest side. Um, so uh, you could either use some existing trees or, or plants that you might have in your yard, or uh, you could plant something that's going to grow tall, uh, like some okra or um, like some corn or something like that, that helps shade them a little bit from that, that later in the afternoon uh, heat from the sun. Okay, so you're saying tomatoes can actually tolerate a little bit of that afternoon shade, especially in the heat of the summer. Yeah, I mean, if they're getting that morning and, and midday sun, that they should okay. be should be okay to set fruit. Awesome. So I'll just throw this next question out since uh, since none of none of you uh, guys signed up for it. Uh, should cherry tomatoes be spaced apart differently than regular tomatoes? Or is that, I mean, I assume that means slicing tomatoes. So are there spacing differences? Sam, maybe we'll throw that one to you. Yeah, I would. Um, they could need different spacing. I would say it comes down to how big that plant generally gets. Most of those cherry and grape type varieties are indeterminate and that vine's gonna get bigger. Okay. So yeah, yeah, spread it out some more, give it three feet between every plant um, or a little bit more. Tomatoes are gonna occupy whatever space you give them to grow. Um, so if you give it three or four feet, it's gonna, it's gonna fill that area up and you'll get more yield per plant, more fruit per plant. For sure. Good answer. I appreciate that. All right. Now I'm going to force all of you to pick a couple of varieties. I know we've danced around it. Nobody wants to come out there, but we, we got to get a couple of varieties out here for folks. So I want each of you to give two or three varieties and Sam's mentioned a couple um, of your favorite varieties to grow. It could be new, could be heirloom, just, it doesn't even have to be the best. Just what have you enjoyed growing over the last couple of years? So we'll start with Larry. I mentioned Amelia earlier. That is a determinant type. It has a good package. It is resistant to the tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, I like the taste. Some personal preference involved with, with that, this question. As far as heirlooms, um, some of the old, you know, the Cherokee purple and uh, brandy wine are two that I, I like, but they're not consistent. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Uh, you might throw a few of those in but don't let that be all that you're growing because they don't have the resistance, but you, you can't hardly beat the taste if, you, if you're fortunate to produce some and, and eat some of those heirloom types. So Amelia, Cherokee purple from a um, heirloom type and then brandy okay. wine from heirloom, heirloom type. Good deal. Going around the screen here, Evan, give us a couple. What do you like? All right. Well, Larry took my Amelia. So I'm gonna add in their uh, super sweet 100s, which are the cherry tomatoes. They've done really well for us. Um, and, and then in turn, I'm gonna add in uh, sun gold as a cherry tomato also, just because those taste like candy. I mean, you can't beat flavor for those. I don't know mm. if they're any good for uh, disease resistance, but. They sure do taste good. Mm -hmm. Matt, give us a couple. Uh, so a couple that I've grown the last Two years uh, were Mountain Magic and Mountain Rouge, uh, and they're fairly hardy um, and has some really good flavor. Uh, one that we we grew uh, when I was in grad school was Bella Rosa, um, and it had some good uh, disease resistance um, tolerance, uh, and it had some good flavor for having that tolerance. That mountain series grows good over there in the mountains of Santa Rosa County, I guess. Oh, yeah, for sure. No, but uh, we, we have grown them pretty, pretty successfully. So. Good deal. All right, Sam, I'm putting you on the spot. Give me a couple. What have, what have you enjoyed? Again, doesn't have to be the best performer in your breeding program. Just yeah. a couple. Like. Yeah, well, I have to start with, um, nobody can laugh at me. I have to start with, with Better Boy, because that's hey. where I grew up as a kid. <laughs> there you go. And I've never had it taste as good as it did back then. And I there cannot grow it down here in Tampa right. as good as my dad did back, the, back there. No, definitely um, not. Uh, as far as newer varieties, um, I still have to keep harping on that Tasty Lee. It's, that's the one I pick and take home to my, to my wife and kids every, 
yeah. every season. Uh, that's a really good eating tomato. And then um, as far as a small fruited type, I still get a few seeds of uh, a variety called Sweethearts. It's a grape tomato. It's indeterminate. And you just have really good sugar levels. It, it tastes great and it yields a lot. Um, so I'm, I still grow that from time to time also. Yeah, so I'll give you, uh, I grew one called, I think it was uh, black cherry. The yield sucked, but man, those fruit were good. So if you just want a few fruit uh, that tastes really good, black cherry is a really good one. And then uh, I'll echo Sam, we grew a lot of better boy. And then uh, my dad started growing the big beef and I, I enjoy the flavor of those, a good indeterminate variety. But yeah, I was, like you with the tomatoes, I try to cook my mom's meatloaf and it just never tastes the same, you know. <laughs> it never <laughs> will. Don't know what it is, but yeah, that's what it is. So, uh, Larry, we're going to switch gears here from varieties and go to tomato issues and some integrated pest management. So tomatoes are uh, the most widely grown uh, vegetable plant out there in gardens, and they're also a favorite of lots of pests. So, Larry, the first question is, they're get, these people are getting lots of, uh, lots of vines and not a lot of tomatoes. Is there a way to kind of reverse that trend and get more tomatoes and less vines? I think some of the old timers refer to those as bully tomato plants. You can do the same thing with other um, vegetables, but you want to be careful about oh, be light handed, provide what the plant needs in the way of nitrogen. Uh, you can even take a vegetable plant uh, such as a tomato and get it going and, and maybe even pick some tomatoes that are ripe and then uh, begin overdoing it with nitrogen and the plant will revert back to its vegetative growth. And um, it's, to me, just be careful not to overdo it with fertilizing, particularly the nitrogen. If yeah. you have other things correct with good soil and adequate light, uh, you know, not a whole lot of tree competition. Um, for the homeowner, what I see is overdoing it with nitrogen that creates vine, encourages a lot of vine or plant yeah. versus tomatoes to pick. Right, I hear you. Uh, Evan, got a good Zoom question here. It's a very common issue. Um, so the tomatoes are getting black on the bottom and rotting. All right, so you, you can see what's coming here. What causes this and how do I prevent it? So I uh, believe what you're describing is called blossom end rot. And I like know. Sam said, uh, that's a pretty common problem, especially with aroma tomatoes, but um, it's caused by a calcium deficiency. Uh, which, strangely enough, doesn't always mean that your soil is deficient in calcium. It could be. So adding calcium might help, uh, but it's usually a watering issue. So if you just keep the watering even so it doesn't dry out or get too wet at any given time, uh, that can really help to uh, solve that problem. Awesome. So yeah, even watering and maybe a calcium calcium supplement like gypsum would, would be a good answer there. So uh, Matt, Evan said that tomatoes need even water, but the question here is, do tomatoes need a lot of water? What do you think? Well, that's one of your it depends answers. So, I mean, if we're, if we're growing in a container, I know right. Sam, Sam said it's a lot, lot harder to keep uh, the soil moist when you're in a smaller container. Uh, you know, you've just got it drying out faster. Um, one thing, uh, well, a couple of things. So, um, if you if you are able to use some sort of mulch, it could be a, a natural mulch like pine straw or um, you know some different pine bark materials, um, and able to keep that moisture in that bed where your tomato is. Uh, you don't have to water them nearly as often. Um, another thing, um, if you are trying to kind of figure out about how much water um, plants need, you know any any plants, even your turf grass. Uh, there's a, a link that we'll post about a blue dye test. Um, so basically you just get some uh, blue dye like they would use to, to mark uh, if, if they're spraying weeds um, in a landscape or something so they know where they've already sprayed. Um, you mix it in a, in a like a backpack sprayer with some water um, and you spray an even layer over like a three foot square area and then you water what you think you need, um, you know, depending on how you're watering overhead, or it could be a drip irrigation or uh, like micro jets. Um, and then you can go and, and dig out that spot and it'd be a lot easier in a sandy soil to see where that blue dye moved. But um, in a lot of our soils, you'll be able to see that blue dye and see how far down it went. So 
uh, think about that and then think about how deep uh, tomato plants roots are going to be so they might be eight inches or, or so um, and uh, and look you know hey am I already running the water too much or do I need to water a little bit more uh, for each one of my watering events all right good deal so Evan this is going to lead right into the next question man I love how y'all are asking these questions that just set up the next one that's awesome <laughs> Uh, on, on the watering topic, Evan, we had lots of folks say, why did my tomatoes, you know, choose your adjective, split, burst, crack, whatever, uh, while on what it, what's the cause of that? They probably got too much water. Um, some of your old heirloom varieties tend to be more like your beef steaks and your, your lumpy looking tomatoes. They tend to be more prone to cracking. But a lot of it is just due to uh, too much water all at once. So again, even watering can really help avoid that. All right. And that's all wonderful. But what if we have a year like last year where it rained almost 90 inches in some areas around the panhandle? Um, yeah. If we have another wet year like that, what would be some strategies to prevent that, you know, that splitting and bursting and cracking? Uh, a cry, maybe? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> Crying won't help. Uh, you can it just add to the water. If you're if you're if you're expecting uh, a lot of water every year, and you know you might around here, you could try a raised bed or mm -hmm. a container where you can more easily control the amount of moisture getting to the to the plant. Uh, you could uh, pull back mulch away from the plant to let the soil dry out a little quicker. Um, to help control disease that's caused by splashing rain, you can um, prune back the the lower leaves on the, the stem uh, down near the soil. So it's not getting that splashing up on the, on the leaves. Um, other than that, I mean, don't wash your car, uh, try and you know, <laughs> avoid the rain hitting it for, for there. I don't know if yeah, you can get superstitious about it, but. There's just so much you can do, but those, uh, those strategies you just listed will do a good job. So Sam, we'll transition to you again. This is going to be along the lines of lots of rain uh, and humidity. So the question is, how do I keep leaves from getting, uh, you know, dark spots? Could be fungus, bacteria, whatever that spreads and ultimately kills the foliage. What are some oh, strategies? Man. Yeah, I'm tempted to say crying, but that answer already yeah. was given. Um, no, when you start getting that rainy weather, it, you you can't stop the foliar diseases, right? Um, if you're not under a covered structure where it keeps the rain off, then you're gonna have to deal with it. Um, the question is what type of disease is call it, causing those spots? There's a number of them. Um, uh, I think there's an EDIS article that got copied over to the chat so folks can see a few different foliar diseases if they wanna check that out. Um, one of the common ones we mentioned already is tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, that does show up as spots, but it's not because of rainfall. That's a virus transmitted by thrips, right? So if, if you figure out that's what you have and you want to avoid that in the future, then going with a resistant variety is about your only option. Um, but there are some bacterial diseases like bacterial speck and bacterial spot that show up and especially bacterial spot in Florida that shows up more frequently than anything else. If White that's your problem. Almost every summer. Yeah, yeah. And there's no really good solution to it. You can take off some of those lower leaves before the disease shows up and maybe prevent some of the spread. You could try spraying some copper. That's what a lot of growers have done, but that's only going to help a little bit. Um, the best thing is to keep your plants from being wet. Maybe space them out a little bit more. Let some more air move around in there. Um, that might help a little bit with both okay. bacterial spot and bacterial speck. Um, those, are the, those are some of the common ones that look like spots. Gotcha. Yeah. And Matt, we get a uh, extremely common question. How do you stake tomatoes? Um, so do you string them up? Do you need what what kind of staking system would you recommend uh, or staking systems uh, for backyard gardeners? So uh, we've got a publication that we'll share uh, from some master gardeners in California, but they kind of did a review of a lot of different staking systems uh, from using like the, the metal cattle panels um, or um, using some like uh, conduit and running it across the top and then running uh, twine down for each plant. Um, one that a lot of the commercial growers use and probably the simplest for me to, to think about, uh, they call just like a Florida weave. Um, so they'll take uh, stakes that are like two inches square um, and 
uh, they'll drive them into the ground and use twine. Uh, so they'll do like stakes for every, between every two or for every two plants. Uh, sometimes commercially they'll do every other or every plant um, and just run twine starting when they get to be like eight or 12 inches tall um, on either side of that plant between the stakes um, and then do it every uh, six or 12 inches or so. And uh, that, that gives that plant some structure to, to grow on. Good deal. And uh, Sam, while we're talking about staking, there was a question in the chat. It's a good, a good time to get to, I think. What is your stance on uh, suckering tomatoes? Uh, you know, trimming off the little, the little suckers that come up. So it's kind of related to staking. So let's go ahead and tackle it. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, um, taking off those suckers on your plants can be really helpful if you're trying to manage like a big vine. We were talking about that just a minute ago. How do you get more fruit and less vine? Um, if, you're, if your variety tends to be excessively uh, viney, then taking off those suckers early on can really help. If you've got an indeterminate variety, um, you probably want to take suckers off at least up until that first flower cluster, maybe even past it. That's going to help promote more fruit set early on, and it's also going to cut down on the jungle a little bit. Um, and the other thing is whether you're determinate or you're indeterminate, taking off some of those suckers will help open up that canopy a little bit. So you could get better airflow, maybe a little bit less disease in there. Yeah. All right. So suckering is probably a good way to go for, for several different reasons. Good deal. Uh, Larry, this is another one of these very specific questions that we love. Last year, my tomatoes did not produce. You know, <laughs> um, maybe go into just a, uh, a checklist of, uh, of reasons to go through to think about what you could do this year. I think that may well, be one of the things when people, uh, especially if they're new to gardening in Florida, they don't need to, they need to be fair to themselves and not judge success or failure in one season or one attempt, just too many variables. Um, I would suggest, you know, learning from your mistakes and, and trying to change. Um, it could be from planting too early, too late, could be from uh, some of your cultural practices, watering too much, fertilizing too much. Pest pressure is, is different every season, every year. Um, if you stick to the basics, planting at a reasonable time, you know, after it warms up, um, not too early, you fertilize to produce a healthy plant. Um, you, you water on, on an as needed basis. Uh, the plants are growing where there's plenty of sunlight and not too much competition from trees. Uh, it, it just too, too many variables to put your finger, I think, on exactly why one year might be a failure and the next year is not. So oh, wow. I, I think learn from your mistakes and try to follow good practices for the part of Florida that you're in. Yeah, I mean, last year was... In some ways it was good because we had a nice cool start to the spring and it was fairly dry and then but man when the water and the heat turned on it didn't stop you know so it was it was tough in some ways so evan you know horticulture folks planters come up with some of the weirdest names and so this question is what causes cat facing so, cat facing yeah, yeah. Cat okay facing. that's a cat face if you're unfamiliar with that term it's uh it, it refers to kind of ugly looking tomatoes so you kind of get this malformed, puckered, uh, sometimes cracked uh, look, especially at the blossom end, um, which which could lead to it, it getting a disease and, and rotting from the blo blo blossom end, but it's not blossom end rot. It's just more uh, malformed fruit with weird protuberances and puckers. Right. Um, we don't know what causes it for sure. Uh, the research hasn't hasn't shown uh, conclusively any one cause, but uh, there's some guesses. Uh, nighttime temperatures that are low when it's flowering, so don't plant too early. Um, uh, not enough water could cause that, so even watering. Uh, too much nitrogen, um, you know, manage your fertilization properly, and then sometimes herbicide injury can cause that, so just be careful if you're spraying your lawn or your uh, surrounding landscapes. Uh, plants with uh, herbicides not to get it on your garden. Good information. Sam, is it more uh, your experience from the uh, 
the commercial side of things, is that an aesthetic issue or is it going to affect your flavor and that sort of thing? And that's the cap facing still. Um, yeah. I don't think it would affect flavor very much if you take that part of the fruit off. Yeah. But the problem for commercial growers is those fruit are not marketable at all. They, right. Every one of them goes in the trash. For a home yeah. gardener, probably not yeah. a huge. It, it just limits how much tomato you actually get to eat off okay. of that fruit. So you, okay. you're going to have to take part of it off. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Bigger deal for a commercial than a home owner. That's good. Good to know the cat face. That's very unfair to cats. I love cats. You know, why did it have to be cat face? Um, Matt, this is a question again, very specific to your area in Santa Rosa County. Uh, where's the best place to get bulk compost over there? <laughs> so we're in the Navarre area. Where can I get compost? I guess other than making your own, um, uh, we talked about compost of pine bark earlier. Um, so we've, we've gotten some from Pinelands Nursery, uh, which is up in East Milton. Okay. Um, so you might want to contact them and see if they have any available. Um, and then I've uh, got the Manning's uh, Feed and Seed. Uh, I know they used to at one time order some of the mushroom compost. So just check with them and, and see where they're at on that. All right. Good deal. Um, Evan, this, this person, there are many people that ask this. So these folks say every year they're having an amazing amount of trouble with insect infestations on tomatoes and peppers growing containers. So what would just be some general tips to, uh, you know, prevent and suppress uh, insects as a, as a group on tomatoes? Welcome, welcome to Florida. We have a, right. a very good climate for all sorts of critters and they will love your tomatoes. Um, that's a, that's a tough question because you have to identify the, the insect problem first before you know how to treat it. So we've got a link there on tomato insect management. If you need help identifying a particular insect, feel free to reach out to me or any of your extension agents around. Um, you know, it, it depends on the insect. So uh, two things that I like to have handy are insecticidal soap and uh, horticultural oil. So, uh, you know, some people will use Dawn dish soap, but we, we try to steer people toward the products that are labeled for use on insects, uh, the, the insecticidal soaps. And then, um, you know, something like neem oil or an, uh, horticultural oil, mineral oil, uh, they sell as insecticides as well. Uh, both of those only work on the insects you actually spray them on. So for things like stink bugs, that's not gonna do much because they're very mobile. Um, for things like aphids, you can just knock them off with a blast of water. If you do that for maybe a week in a row, it'll really disrupt their life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, take a look at that uh, insect management guide and uh, give us a holler and we can help you identify exactly what the problem is and maybe how to, how to stop right, it. Right, for sure. Matt, um, I've had the problem that this, this client's had here uh, several times the last couple of years, and that's how to keep the uh, stink bugs away from tomatoes. So maybe just talk quickly about what the damage looks like and what you can do to mitigate stink bugs in the tomato garden. Uh, so the, the damage on the, on the fruit are all these little black spots where they um, stuck their mouth part in there and, uh, when, they, when the tomato was really young. Um, so it's important that you, you scout for uh, stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs when, when when they're in their immature stages or their their um, nymph uh, stages, uh, and a lot of times they'll be like an orange color. Um, stink bugs might be just look like a, a baby version of a, a stink bug, um, and and try to control them when they're at that stage of growth. Um, so uh, some people. Some people might might vacuum them off. We've seen that with some different things. Um, and uh, Evan mentioned oils. So when they are in that younger stage, you, you could treat them with some oils. Uh, once they get to be adults, they're pretty difficult to control. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing might be using uh, trap crops. Uh, so you might want to uh, grow some uh, sunflowers or um, some people use uh, yucca to, to attract those insects away. They, they like the flowers of those uh, crops. Um, and then you could just kill them when they're on that crop or, or remove that portion of the crop and, and get it out of your garden area. Good deal. Thanks, Matt. Stink bugs are a big issue in the garden. Evan, he mentioned trap crops and something that's sort of related to that. Again, nice segue, Matt. How do marigolds um, and basil and, and things like that aid tomatoes? You know, you hear a lot of old wives' tales about planting marigolds with your tomatoes. Is there truth to yeah. that? 
There, there is some truth to that. Um, a lot of the companion planting uh, information out there is kind of colloquial and doesn't have a lot of research-based information behind it. Um, that being said, there can be some benefits to planting things like uh, marigolds or uh, basil, or you know, there's a lot of different ones that people will say uh, ward off insects or, or animals. Um, your mileage may vary depending on how hungry the critter is at that given time. Um, I did find one article on uh, nematode management, which says that marigolds are very good at, at repelling nematodes. Um, if you know you have a problem with nematodes, then you might try planting some marigolds. You have to get them pretty close uh, to the plant to do anything, and that will mean you have to manage the garden a lot more. Uh, you're, you're running into some potential problems with, you know, keeping the ground too humid or uh, splashing with rain, but um, that is an option. Uh, okay. I, I don't think I don't think it's going to be a silver bullet, though. Again, right. there's no silver bullet, and any problem you have, it might help, but it's not going to get rid of it completely. Okay. Uh, so, folks, thanks. Thank y'all for sticking with us. We've been here for one hour. We've only got two questions left, so we're going to be wrapping up here directly. But if you need to run, we appreciate you being here. I um, mean, we'll go ahead and get to our last two questions. And ones we haven't touched on yet, Sam, um, fertilization. What's your preference on fertilizing tomatoes grown in containers? Um, you know, there's recommendations for various liquid programs every couple of weeks. What would you recommend? Uh, there's so much flexibility there. Um, the main thing is if you deliver those proper nutrients uh, and, and a good balance, then you're going to be okay. Um, okay. I think the suggestion in the question was 18-18-21 uh, liquid. Yep. Um, that sounds reasonable. Um, usually it's good to have a little bit more potassium in there for tomatoes. Almost most growers will put out about twice as much potassium as they do nitrogen. And that helps a lot with that deep red color, that lycopene development. Okay. Right? Um, but I just say, if you're in a container, again, you've got less room for the roots to grow. Um, so it's a lot easier to burn up your plant with salt if you put too much fertilizer on. So just be careful with it and okay. follow up follow a very routine schedule with it. All right, good deal. And Matt, the last question here, let's talk about, so the client wants us to talk about saving tomato seeds. Um, and so maybe talk about saving seeds for a minute and then just list uh, you know, a couple of seed companies uh, that you might recommend that folks can order seed from, from uh, and get a good selection. Um, so uh, tomatoes, I mean, when you look at the inside of a tomato fruit it, it's a lot different than most anything else we grow um, so they do have locules and that's the, the area where that gel is and then the seeds are inside that gel uh, that gel is uh, inhibits uh, the the actual germination of a seed while it's in the the tomato itself so we need to get that gel off of those seeds so one way to do it with that is um, people will, will take the gel and the seeds, put it in like a mason jar with some more water um, and let it sit for a week or so. Uh, it might grow a little bit of mold that you have to skim off, um, but uh, that water gel seed mixture will ferment enough to help get that gel off of those seeds. Uh, then you can drain the water off and take your seeds and dry them on like a paper plate uh, paper towels, they, they stick to and they're kind of hard to get off of. Um, so a paper plate would be recommended um, and it allows them to dry because it's a, a paper product. Um, yeah. the, the important thing with, with saving seed is, I mean, luckily with tomatoes, they're, they're perfect flowers, so they're going to pollinate themselves. Uh, but uh, it's important that you know that some of the, the, the hybrid varieties, the seed that you save from those tomatoes might not look like that variety that you're trying to keep. So uh, with the open pollinated varieties, um, you know, they, they are pretty much the seed that's been passed on or the heirloom varieties. Uh, so they are gonna produce a, a similar tomato. All right, and then the rest of you folks, uh, maybe list a couple of seed uh, vendors that you might like. Matt, what, what's the seed vendor that you might recommend? I, I order from Johnny Selected Seeds a lot for okay. pretty much any type of seed. Evan? Oh, there's, uh, there's a number of different ones. Um, uh, seed Savers Exchange, uh, Fedco Seed, Burpee. I mean, there's a bunch. Yeah. 
Larry, Sam? Um, I think they're still, uh, I haven't ordered from them in a while, but I think they're still in business. Tomato Growers, which I believe is down in South Florida. Uh, some of these seed catalogs, if you look them up online and they, they might have a, a copy available online or you can order, get yourself on the, the list of uh, ordering that. I think once you get on their, their list, they'll probably continue to send, send you a seed catalog for several years. Yeah, Sam. Yeah, um, the one Larry mentioned, Tomato Grower Supply Company. I've used them before. I think they are still open. Um, Twilly Seed Company. I think they're based out of Georgia. They have a, um, a decent selection. And sometimes they have some newer varieties there that aren't, aren't okay. available in other places. Um, and then Johnny's, yeah, I've used them also. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you all for making it uh, today with us. We put our uh, survey in the chat. If you could take a moment and fill that out, it really helps us uh, know how we did and know where to go with future sessions uh, and, and help us know if you learned anything. So I want to thank uh, Larry, Evan, Matt, Julie, and Beth uh, for making this happen. Um, and especially want to thank Sam for taking time out of his day to uh, talk to our clientele here in the Northwest District, spend a little time talking tomatoes with us. Uh, one of our favorite topics. Sam, if you want, I'll let you leave us with a, a word of wisdom for tomatoes before we leave today. Yeah, I really do appreciate it. This is um, my favorite topic in the world, I think, to talk about. So this is, this is a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, we appreciate it. That's all we've got for you today. Y'all be sure to fill out our survey and check back with us for future Gardening in the Panhandle Lives. And have a great afternoon. Good luck tomato gardening this year.